Hi guys, it is a hot sweltering April day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization in the great state of Texas here on this otherwise lovely late April day and this is Sam Mitchell and you have found your way to Collapse Chronicles for this week. For this week's podcast, I have the great pleasure. We're going to go all the way down to Australia again today, uh, where we're going to talk to a good friend of a regular here on Collapse Chronicles, Julian Cribb. Uh, he has said, I really need to talk to this gentleman, and I am really looking forward to getting to know John Hewson. And... For those of you, for our Australian listeners, I'm quite sure John Hewson is probably a, a somewhat of a household name. He was a longtime politician in, uh, in Australia. I would love to get into that, but we have a lot more to talk about. So right now, uh, Professor John Hewson is an economist and a former politician he is the chair of the Board of the Commission for the Human Future, which is what we're going to be centering on, and a professor in the Crawford School of Public Policy at ANU. And then the Commission for the Human Future, which he is the chairman of, is a body of researchers and concerned citizens dedicated to finding and developing solutions to the greatest challenge in human history, the complex of catastrophic global threats that now confront us all. And their main goal is to alert humans to the looming planetary crises caused by a group of 10 interlinked potentially catastrophic threats to the human future. That's quite a mouthful. Uh, so John Houston, come on and say hello to the folks, and we're going to dive right into this. All right, thanks very much, Sam. It's a pleasure to be here, of course, and uh, it's Julian Kruber has been instrumental in a lot of the work that we've been focused on here. And uh, as you say, I think you've interviewed him three times. Um, it, uh, we don't want it to be the Julian Cribb show, but he is pretty quite <laughs> He's a great guy. He is a great guy. I really like Julian. Yeah. Well, that's going to be the John Hewson show uh, t tonight. So before we get into this, John, I, I, as, I, I, as much as I would like to uh, just be talking about your life and times, I am interested when you when, usually discussions about... Uh, catastrophic global threats, particularly environmental threats, the last person that you're going to find having any interest in, either, in this subject is an economist or a politician. So how did a, an economist and a politician wind up as the chairman of the Commission for the Human Future? Just give us a little bit of your history and then we'll dive into it. Yeah, I sort of lose on both counts, don't I, Sam? Um, <laughs> You know, in the cocktail party, you don't easily own up to being one of either of those two. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, having said that, look, um, I've been concerned about the issue of climate. It was my mo initial motivation going back to the late 80s, early 90s, when, uh, you know, we tried to move the debate in Australia at a time where, you know, the, the, the climate scientists were basically saying that... Um, that we'd have to face a series of extreme weather events that would occur with greater frequency and intensity. And that has certainly happened. And against that, we've had a very long-term, unproductive, very political debate in Australia about it. Uh, but uh, we arrived today with um, the um, COVID-19 pa uh, pandemic, which, uh, you know, is pretty much, uh, I think, best for us to what makes the situation continue for the law of science the physical world and the demands of uh, these uh, catastrophic threats that mentioned, one of which is, of course, climate change. Okay, so we're going to, uh, guys, what we're going to be concentrating here in this interview is this 38-page paper that I'm going to put a link in here uh, titled Surviving and Thriving in the 21st Century, A Discussion and Call to Action 
on global catastrophic risks, and so we're 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 not going to get too bogged down in the uh, in the coronavirus pandemic. But I, I want to read this. This is what John wrote on March 28th, and I'm just so we're get, this is going to be kind of our launch pad into the rest of this discussion. Okay, John wrote, quote, What we are facing now with COVID-19 is a dress rehearsal for other threats to come. The coronavirus pandemic, Australia's recent bushfire crisis, and severe drought highlight how catastrophic risks are building up. These are a wake-up call to the whole of humanity that it is time for action. So, uh, John, spend a couple of minutes, you know, connecting some dots to what we are seeing on this planet now, and why is the COVID-19 pandemic a dress rehearsal for other threats to come? Well, I think it's sort of, in a, in a sense, caught the world by surprise, caught the world short, as we'd say in Australia. They were unprepared. And this reflects the fact that governments are disturbingly unprepared for most of the threats that we've identified. Uh, that's including policy authorities. They seem incapable of accepting scientific and other evidence, for example. They fail to listen to clear warnings and predictions, are generally unwilling to think longer term and strategically as politics particularly and policy makers become very short term. And so they, were, they, they, they don't have any plan as to how to avoid or to manage these uh, series of catastrophic risks that are mounting, amount, I think, and uh, will threaten our living and, li and lifestyle and, um, in, and um, threaten the, human, the, the possibility of human survival. So we've identified the 10 major risks that we see. We see them as interconnected. They are basically um, a decline in natural resources and you know, resource, resource crisis, if you like, and emerging global resource crisis, so, including water, which uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence about the significance of the water crisis, which is ignored. There's collapse of the ecosystems that support life and uh, with mass extinction for various species. Population growth and the demand that's beyond the Earth's carrying capacity. Uh, global warming, sea level rising, climate change, um, all affecting human activity, increasingly ever in that case. Uh, universal pollution of the, of, of the earth, of pollution, rising insecurity and uh, failing nutritional quality, um, various other pandemics, untreatable diseases, possibility, the advent of uh, very new and powerful technologies uh, that uh, are impacting significantly on our lives. And of course, there's a global... Um, national and global failure to understand and act preventively these risks. And I can use an example of a stroke recent... Now, you did forget, I think you've forgotten, but don't forget our, uh, one of our favourites here on Collapse Chronicles, nuclear arms and other weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, you know, the risk of a nuclear war, that's... that's <laughs> yeah, you let that one slip by. Uh, that that, that, all, that <laughs> nuclear war threat can, can always just uh, slip, slip us by. So how did you rate these? Now, of course, I would have put overpopulation as number one. Are, are, are those 10 in any uh, particular order? No, no, we don't. We don't. We haven't sought to rate them. Uh, we are about in, emphasizing the interconnectedness of them. And, you know, one of the, the frustrations is just the response of governments to these threats. I mean, in Australia, we've just had historically significant drought, and historically significant bushfires, we're grossly unprepared for those. On top of that came the COVID-19. Uh, and basically, um, they were unprepared. All of that, and OK, the book buyers have ended and the drought is finished. Uh, and so just go on. We won't do anything to prepare for the next round of, of those, those uh, significant environmental impacts. So that's our big concern, just getting in the global community, starting with obviously in the Australian community, of getting a great focus on the significance of these threats. The coronavirus has really ended up bringing forth reactions that most people a couple even a month, month or two ago wouldn't contemplate that they do. You know, we've had lockdowns and closing various industries and uh, distancing, social distancing requirements, on which which changed people's lifestyles dramatically. And most people have 
still been part of that. So our message is very positive in the sense you can, you can, by addressing these issues, develop policy responses that working collaboratively and, and globally, uh, we can certainly make a difference, reduce the significance of the threat, in fact, in some cases, eliminate. Uh, okay, but what? The, but 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 the takeaway from from this one, and as you said, the bushfires and the drought. What, what we're seeing, I, I don't think anybody can deny. No matter quote what side uh, of this debate you're, uh, you're you're quote choosing on on how best to react to this. I think one, one thing that we can pretty much all agree on is that by and large, this planet was uh, caught with her pants down, just completely unprepared for this, just like uh, Australia, we, you said, with those bushfires. I mean, what did Australia learn from the bushfires when this happens again next year? Are you any better prepared in Australia if, if this happens again next year than you were this year, or is it just going to be a repeat of the same? The same well, thing? I I fear in terms of bushfires and droughts, for example, which Australia has had a very long history of as an increasingly dry uh, uh, um, continent, um, you know, the, 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 it was just like politically, we'll just get through it, then we'll go on to something else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a tragedy, say, in the area of, of drought, that there's a very large body of evidence in Australia and globally about regenerative agriculture and how you can improve the resilience of the soil, make them more drought resistant by simply very simple changes in farming practices. And, and it doesn't cost a lot of money. It, uh, most of the farmers are willing to, to, to make the shift. But uh, there's no leadership in this issue, on this issue in a country like Australia, which has been bedeviled by drought in its entire history. Yeah, so I, I just want to read one, one more paragraph out of this uh, out of this paper. Then we're just, we're just going to wing it after this uh, because mm -hmm. uh, th th this I think is one of your central points, and it's certainly uh, one of the recurring themes with people I talk to from all over this planet. Okay, we assert that at present, no nation or government on Earth. Not one, no uh, nation or government on earth recognizes all of these threats as a related complex, nor does any, again, nor does one single country on this planet have an explicit policy for human survival. We consider this needs to change urgently to focus world attention on what needs to be done. I mean, you, you've got a you, you've got a tall order. I mean, we, we you know there's no sense. I, I mean, it would be fun for me to sit here and we could just spend an hour, to, you know, breaking down these ten global threats. You, you, you know, talking about how each one of them, you know, teased apart from the other ones is bad enough. But you you roll all of this ball of wax together, we're completely overwhelmed. Uh, as na as individuals, nations, and some would say as a planet. So, what do you do with this level of, of threat here at this late hour? Well, basically, uh, the aim is to try and, and and increase global awareness of the significance and urgency of these threats, and and you know start to rely on science. So much of the policy debate and political debate around the world ignores science. And uh, you see some pretty exa extreme examples of that. Uh, and they don't see that this is anything that they really need to prepare for. And so, for example, in the climate area, we have the Paris Accord, which is a very significant agreement. Uh, it was 100 and what is it, 96 countries are actually agreed on something, which is uh, significant, but they're not implementing it. And they're way short of what would be required to, say, get to net zero emissions by the middle of the century. And, and there's a classic case where, you know, they're all talking the right issue, but then when it comes to the translation of that to their particular policy positions, they're not doing it. And, and um, or, you know, some are doing it more than others. And, and you know, in fact, uh, ironically, some of the countries that were, support were, were supposed to not be doing much, like China and India are doing quite a lot. Europe, of course, is doing a lot. Uh, America stepped back. Uh, Australia stepped back. No, even from those Paris commitments, they don't give them the priority and urgency that they deserve. And, of course, globally, we will end up with a planet that warms by four or five degrees 
rather than net zero by the middle part of the century. And that would be catastrophic. And, you know, we're just drifting over the... You know, starting out to drift with what was about a three-decade decade challenge for the world to actually face the reality of that. Now, the COVID-19 shows that we can do it, we can come together, we can recognise that that virus doesn't respect national boundaries, so that while there's an individual country response, there's also a global response that's very important. So we've got to build that awareness, the understanding and significance of the, of the science, talk about the uh, options that are possible, paint a picture of hope, really. I mean, it can be a very positive story. A lot of good things can come out of adjusting to these things. They're not necessarily, you know, they they are threats of being catastrophic, but they don't meet, is, is our point. So, uh, where, where, where do we begin? You, you, you know... I, I, I've been doing this off and on for the last 10 years of my life, and uh, actually I've been doing it off and on for the last uh, 40 years of my life. You know, this sounds, this, this re excellent report, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm not denigrating the report, I encourage anybody to read this, to educate themselves. But, you know, I swear I remember reading a very similar thing like 1992, uh, by the what were the Union of Concerned Scientists talking about their warning to humanity at the Rio summit, I believe, and that has been updated. We've uh, you know the limits of growth uh, back in 1972 or whenever that was. We we've for for people down here in what what I call this rabbit hole. Uh, you're probably talking to you know a much more educated group than obviously with the name like Collapse Chronicles. People tuning into this interview are, are going to be somewhat interested and, edu and, and educated on this subject. But you know, how, how do we break from this? It's from this you know the preaching to the choir. Uh, mm. to to get this message out. I mean, it, 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 if people aren't falling over dead in the streets and it, it, if refrigerated trucks in New York City aren't filling up with dead bodies, it, it, is that what it's gonna is, is that what it's gonna take for for people to take these the, 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 these ten things looming in the future? Is, is that what we're going to need to, to to have happen before people take these seriously? Well, that's my point about the uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic being a dress rehearsal. People are starting to understand that these are very significant risks. I mean, there'd been a lot of uh, speculation and prediction about the possibility of another pandemic. Some governments had set up some structures to deal with that, but never taken it sufficiently seriously. Now, of course, it's happened. It's happened much faster than people imagine. You've used the example of what's happened, say, in New York City, and uh, you know, and the and the and the the ugliness of, of that process as well. Uh, although we've all made a lot of progress in terms of of collaborating uh, both internally, domestically, and internationally, it's still say we've got a long way to go in terms of the virus because the there are, every country's got a different response, although collectively they are moving all in the right direction. And I fear we don't, what we're really saying is we shouldn't have to get to this stage of a crisis to actually get the sort of reaction that we've seen, which, which was, you know, which has changed, uh, in, in Australia's changed business, it's changed lifestyles and probably uh, permanent. I mean, people will change as a result of this and will adjust their behaviour. And that's what we've got to get that message across in relation to these other other nine uh, threats. The uh, uh, so you're, you're, uh, I say so the other nine in addition to pandemics. Yeah, this, that's right. I mean, this certainly is, is, is not the last. Uh, let, let's just take that one, which which wasn't even. I know you said you did not prioritize your list, but it was actually down pretty pretty far down your list. Uh, so, so. Yeah, there's been a lot of speculation, for example, in in a medical area about antibiotic resistance, right? and what would happen if there was suddenly a shortage of antibiotics, or they became globally ineffective, which is happening very quickly. 
and we have no obvious alternative, uh, the consequences for many diseases would be very significant. Now, that has been around, it's been the top of the list in, in countries like the UK, for example, but uh, you still haven't seen that translated to positive uh, responses, to substantive responses. So there's still a fair bit of learning to be done and a lot of public acceptance of the significance of the issue. Um, as I say, we don't put any priority on the list that we put. But just to just go back a year or two, and the risk of a nuclear confrontation was very real with North Korea. It's still a risk in, in the Middle East. Well, <laughs> with that the Iranians, one that... example. You know, these are big threats. Look, what you can wake up one day and it's already happened, you know, and that's yeah, well, the problem. Yeah, the nuclear war threat, that, that's the one that it, 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 could, it could sit back at, at number 10, uh, but, but, but in a space of, uh, of 12 hours, it could rocket, uh, <laughs> you know, where there, there's, there's going to be no question where the number one is, the, you know, that is the, you know, the real wild card is cause that one could, uh, if you think that the coronavirus uh, spiraled out of control uh, well, over a space of, uh, of two months, uh, we, we could have in a space of two hours, we, you know, and it's just the, the, the challenges, and it seems to me and, and other people I've interviewed, let's just take the nuclear one, uh, that we are, didn't they? They just moved the doomsday clock uh, yep. to the clock. It's, it's, it's an hour. It's one minute and forty seconds. They're actually dividing up minutes now. It's one hundred seconds. It's closest yep. to midnight than it's ever been. Uh, but you know, between nuclear, between nuclear holocaust and and, and, and climate change, you know, Earth overshoot day. Uh, it was earlier last year than it's ever been. Uh, carbon emissions are at their all-time high. Uh, it, it's just like everywhere we're, you know, we, we've had 30, 40 years to be working on this, John. And uh, Yeah, I mean, and that, that issue is really disturbing because you've got the nine nuclear armed states that are still modernizing their arsenals. With <laughs> technology to fetch capacities. And you've only got, what is it, 69 countries have declined to sign the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I mean, these are, it's, it's all heading, in the, if you like, in the wrong direction. And, and with a couple of areas of the world where the risks are very significant, I mean, India, Pakistan, uh, Middle East, Iran, uh, even, uh, I guess, Israel, uh, North Korea, um, these are very significant existing risks that have been, they've come and gone in terms of public awareness but never been afforded the sense of urgency and substance that you hope they would. And 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 now, I I, I know we're 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 talking about how the corona pandemic can uh, be be a launch pad to to start concentrating on on some of these uh, bigger things looming in the future. But, but the immediate thing is, uh, what is your comment on this? As, as important as the corona story is, it is the only story on the planet, as you and I both know, and all other news. I mean, it started, starting with climate change, there's all other news, even your release of this paper. You know that you're going to have a lot tougher time bringing this out now than if you had brought this uh, paper out uh, three months ago, because th there is uh, the, the media is on it, it's the mainstream and the alternative media. It, is, it has a one track mind. Every other story has been knocked off the table. Uh, the, these other ten threats, which hardly got it, got any press anyway. Maybe climate change, but even climate change has disappeared. Uh, off of the news pages, and uh, what, what do you make of all that? Well, I think you, you're right that it's become, you know, the dominant issue. It's the only one, basically. I mean, I notice on our evening news, we're lucky to get any other news apart from some, some um, element of the impact of the pandemic. But um, we are, in Australia, for example, making a transition away from 
the, the, the virus, getting it under control, and looking at the economic consequences of some of the policies that have been put in place and how we exit from that. Of course, there's a big focus then on how we restore growth or how we how we um, how we um, rekindle economic activity and recreate jobs and so on. In that context, the debate will will move is moving to saying, okay, perhaps we could do more in relation to climate. Perhaps we should do something about waste recycling. Perhaps we do something about fuel security, which are big issues, elements of the climate challenge in Australia. And they'll bring them new industries and new businesses and new jobs. And, but, you know, it's that transformation. You go back to the old way, oh, let's just do what we did before. It's, you know, our, our government's been talking about bouncing back, snapping back to uh, where we were before. Well, we weren't in very good shape before economically. And, um, you know, there were, the, pre- the pressure is now on to think about strategic Go take a longer-term strategic view of what sort of structure of society you want, what sort of industrial structure you want, and um, so I'm. Although it's uh, dominated the the uh, headlines so far, it opens up the possibility of a wide-ranging response, which would see a restructuring of our economy, and I think this is going to happen globally, to focus on different activities, which are going to be consistent with dealing with some of these these threats. Uh, um... Uh, okay, I, 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 I mean, I just see, I, I, as far as the media attention on this story, uh, I, I just, as far as I can see in, into the future, once the public health threat begins to ebb a little bit, whenever, whenever that happens, then what we're going to, the news cycle is going to move into is digging back out, but it's still going to be focused on, uh, on, 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 on digging back out and the economy and stuff. So uh, I, I, I'm just hoping that, uh, you know, at some point, uh, you, you know, like uh, the sixth mass extinction, I'm looking at the, uh, the, the number two thing, collapse of ecosystems that support life. I, I, I haven't seen one story about the collapse of ecosystems that, that support life uh, in, in the past two months? No, I mean, we had some of that, for example, in the context of the bushfires, where some scientific groups identified maybe a billion species that were lost in Australia. Yeah. And um, that, that got quite a lot of attention at the time, but, of course, it's been now replaced by the, <laughs> by, by the virus and uh, as, a, as, a, as a point of focus. But... People started to realise the, the, that something should have been done to prepare better for those bushfires, and particularly when we've had them every other year for as long as people can remember. And this was historically the most significant set of fires, and um, you know for which we weren't prepared. And then, of course, the consequences of not being prepared, and not just in terms of loss of you know, houses and businesses and so on, and, and loss of life, but people started to focus on the impact on on the ecosystem, and so. We got close to it being an issue. Uh, I don't think people forget that, but it, it's dominated today by the virus. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I want to move the discussion a little bit. Uh, this uh, <clears throat> looking at the the uh, I like this sentence. The, 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 this this has Julian Krebb written all over it. I, I think Julian was probably the main uh, author. I'm guessing of this. Paper the the human species' ability to cause mass harm to itself has been accelerating since the mid twentieth century. That's for sure. Okay, the root causes. We're looking at the, the now. Now this does seem like maybe you uh, prioritize them. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm going to read the very first one, and because no discussion on this channel is complete without. Uh, well, well, I guess you didn't even hit the O word. You, at least you hit the P word. There are root causes of all of these 10 threats include, and the first thing on the list, a massive increase in population leading to vast overconsumption of resources. Obviously, this is a recurring theme, Uh, you know, even uh, Ted Turner, uh, what's the problem on this planet, Mr. Billionaire? It's too many people eating too much stuff. 
and and over and over again we 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 get to this. So is that the, do you agree that the the number one root cause is a massive increase in population leading to vast overconsumption of resources? Well, we are still not ranking them, but I, I don't downplay the significance of that. I mean, we've now got what about seven point something, seven point seven billion uh, in the world, going to ten billion. Um, um, or 11 billion, I think, by 20, 20, 2100. And then, you know, we've, uh, it's just way beyond the Earth's capacity to support that sort of level of population. And uh, I know that some of the work that's been done is starting to predict much lower numbers because they think there'll be some adjustment to that reality. But, you know, when you look at uh, the fact that I think humanity is currently consuming about 1.6 times the regenerative capacity of the earth, <laughs> there is an immediacy to that threat. And, um, you know, yet there are solutions in terms of, of how we address, uh, you know, the issues like water security, uh, food security and so on, which um, will involve a change of lifestyle um, in, in, in many ways, but it's, it's, it can be very positive. Okay, uh, let's... Uh... I, I I I hope you're I hope you're right on that. Let's uh, well let, let's spend just a little bit more because I know somewhere in this 38 pages you uh, you actually uh, went you actually touched the third rail a little bit. I am uh, uh, I am looking to where you actually went there uh, down on about what we're going to do about uh, overpopulation. I'm on page 20. I don't know if I just haven't gotten to it yet or... Uh, uh, but, but anyway, what is, what is the... What are you putting forth as the solution? Well, we haven't... In this paper, we haven't actually um, um, identified solutions. We put down some factors which will be taken into account and we're having, this was the first round table of the Commission. We'll have a series of round tables now on each of these existential threats and uh, we, will, um, we will look in detail, although we had a good cross-section of, of, of the skill sets in relation to these threats at, at uh, around 40 individuals across all those threats, we didn't go to the detail of any, any response, although there are some elements of a framework for, for the appropriate response. Okay, here I have found it. It's on page 26. Uh, so, guys, if you go on this, uh, okay, now you got, now this sounds like a priority. All right, this is under the heading uh, lower human numbers. I think by lower, that's the verb lower and not the <laughs> adjective. Uh, low, lower human numbers, I think that's a verb. A fourfold increase in human numbers since the mid 20th century is the underlying driver, that's a singular word, driver of all the catastrophic risks we now face. Uh, then, it's then, then, combined with our overconsumption of scarce resources, so a key question therefore is. How can we slow both population growth and its impact in ways that can enable survival and prosperity for all? Are you saying we're not quite ready to, uh, I mean, you touch on it about limiting the human birth rate voluntarily, uh, but are, are you going to have some more information in the future? Yeah, we have we have a group within the commission that's very concerned about this issue, obviously, and they they are going to we are going to have a separate session on population, which looks at some of the practical responses. I mean, it is true, as we say in this report, that women worldwide have already voluntarily limited their own fertility from five babies per woman in '65 to 2.4 now uh, in in in, uh, in recent times. That's a tangible expression yeah, of, yeah. of over-leadership by women. But um, we still have a way to go to deal with the point you're making, which is the fact that the demands on the resources of the world, the, the capacity of the world 
to support a population approaching 10 or 11 billion people. It, it just doesn't exist. And so there's a lot of elements to a positive response to that sort of challenge. Part of it's to do with the birth rate and, 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 uh, and so on. Part of it's going to be doing, on the other side, working on the capacity of the Earth to, to do more. And, you know, the extent to which we have massive waste, for example, and we don't recycle that effectively, it constrains our capacity to respond as well. So it's a multifaceted response that's required. Okay, so I, I would be uh, keep keep me between you and Julian when when you guys do have that meeting. Uh, I would very much be interested in uh, in interviewing the wh whoever is the quote leader of that roundtable. Uh, yeah, no, would, would make be... a real good interview. I think it's an early priority, so we'll keep you informed, Sam, and certainly. Um, it, it, you know, we, we couldn't go in this, in this discussion, which was a one-day roundtable, we couldn't go into the detail of a lot of this, although some people wanted to. So that's why we've decided to have a series of these roundtables. That was just a general um, first cut, if you like, focusing on the threats and uh, some detail around each of those. But going into in each roundtable to come, there will be a detailed discussion of that issue and uh, looking at the, the, the upside, what, what can be done about it, how much better we can make it, what sort of transition will be required, and so on. Okay, I want you to comment briefly on uh, the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I, I'm going to admit, John, uh, I've interviewed uh, several people over the past two years who have have nothing but uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't even know how to how to delicately phrase their opinion of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Now you guys are on record. Uh, let's see. The UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals offer a broad and carefully considered road to a safer, more sustainable future, sustainable human future in which catastrophic risks are much reduced. So you, you do, you are someone who puts faith. Are you personally uh, putting much stock in the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Yeah, well, look, again, look, if we're looking first for collaborative action, the, 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 the adoption of those goals by 193 nations back in 2015 was a significant step. You can always ask yourself whether we shouldn't have done more or whether yeah. it meant very much. But then again, of course, in 2019, the world leaders committed to a decade of action and uh, translating that to deliver on each of those specific goals, and they have been measuring performance relative or outcomes relative to those goals. Uh, in Australia, I'm also chairman of the Business Council for Sustainable Development, which works with the business community in response to those, those, uh, those uh, sustainable development goals. And th there is a momentum developing at that level. Uh, I'm not uh, going to overstate it because we still have a long way to go. But you got, what you got was a global framework within which you can make, you can work uh, on actions to make uh, some response. And that's really where it sits right now. I'm still hopeful that um, given the reaction I've seen at the business community and the World Business Council would say, for sustainable development, would say the same thing. At least the business community has recognised these challenges. We're seeing it reflected in the investment community where there's a lot more focus in allocating monies these days on, to, on the basis of sustainability um, and, uh, and uh, principles of good governance and environmental and social impact and so on are becoming a big factor in investment allocation. So the momentum is building. It's building slowly, perhaps not as fast as people would want to see, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about this. So the uh, so su sustainable development is uh, Derek. I don't know if you're familiar with this fellow Derek Jensen, who I've introduced several times. Derek Jensen calls the term sustainable development the oxymoron of the 21st century. I think is how he he describes it. So you do think that uh, corporations 
can take a leadership role in, uh, in, in changing their behavior. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing evidence of that. And uh, it's interesting how, you know, some of the members in, in Australia have, have, have adjusted. I mean, we've had a big issue in Australia about plastics, for example. And I've noticed, noticed that um, some of the packaging groups and uh, some of the uh, like Coca-Cola, some of the, you know, the, the uh, fast food groups and so on are, are looking at how they should improve that. As, and then that's consistent with these sustainable development goals, and they know that the, the use of those, you know, of, of, of plastic bottles, for example, isn't sustainable. So we have a very fast transition away. But at the household level, we've moved away from single-use plastic bags in supermarkets. Um, you know, these are elements of a response to sustainability. And uh, you know, a lot of our focus in, in, in debates in Australia on power, for example, has been to use the huge natural resource Australia's got in terms of wind and solar, yeah. uh, which is very cost effective, but using it more effectively. And businesses are now signing up to being 100% renewable energy by 2025 or 2030 and adjusting their own strategies. And this, this is just a natural progression of them. And, you know, it's good for business. Um, I remember I was on the board of a, a big printing group, very heavy, intensive user of electricity and power and, um, and logistics and transport about 15 years ago. And I suggested to the board that we look at our carbon footprint. And they thought I was a bit insane, that uh, why would I be bothered looking at that? But we had an independent assessment of it, and it just said, look, if you just reorganise your use, don't cut anything or, or fire anyone, just reorganise your use of electricity within the day and your transport and logistics, and you can improve the bottom line of this company by 30%. And suddenly, I was a genius and everything thought that was a great idea. And, of course, it was a huge cost saving. Now, business is starting to do those sort of calculations to think about you know, whether what they're doing makes a lot of sense from their point of view. And it's all consistent with moving in the, war, in the direction of sustainability. So you so you so you're optimistic on this front. Obviously, if you have the position, what what I'm sorry, what was your position on the? I, the we, we are the Sustainable Business Council of Australia, Business Council for Sustainable Development, I should say, of Australia, which is linked with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And um, yeah, there's interesting websites there that give you quite a lot of information about the detail of the responses consistent with those sustainable development goals. And, um, you know, we work on many fronts and, uh, you know, in Australia, issues like recycling, recycle the, the circular economy. You know, we don't have any fuel security. We import all our fuel from Singapore by ships. If the 44 ships don't come, we don't have any. So the big focus on developing, taking waste, turning it into biofuels, into ethanol, into into um, into um, biodiesel, and so on. So these are big, big steps forward, and the government started to realise the significance of this, and they're now focusing heavily on maybe a, a roadmap for the bio economy, um, which is all consistent with the challenge of climate, consistent with sustainable development goals. It's all in the right direction. A lot slower than most people would want to see, but it's happening. Okay, to those people who uh, who generally applaud, I mean, any uh, any direction away from just what I call pure uh, unobstructed planet eating, which uh, we you know the Jair Bozo Nero model, as I call it, any uh, anything we can do uh, to move away from that. Uh, from that model is fine, but I, I, I want to, uh, a recurring theme I hear in the comments from these, uh, when, when I have interviews like this, is to have these conversations is fine, but to have them not within the context of making the larger objective, uh, bringing the population down on this planet that it, it that it's folly basically so how how would you how, how do you combine those two uh, are you follow me how would you respond to someone who left that comment if someone leaves that comment on this interview 
uh, let's just pretend that they're going to and respond to that comment because they are going to. <laughs> I'm not sure I understood you, Sam. Uh, okay, um, the, the comment is going to be, uh, while I generally agree with John that this is a that this is a good goal to have businesses doing this and, and all of these ideas to have this conversation outside of reducing population, we need to make the reducing the population the umbrella of uh, of all of this other stuff. Uh, do you uh, do, do you agree with that? Yeah. Look, I. Well, that's why we say these threats are interrelated, yeah. and you you picked up a particular relationship, and you've elevated the population element to a, a priority. Uh, we can see that it is one of the fundamental things that has happened. I mean, to go back to that comment you took from Julian, uh, since the middle part of the twentieth century, I mean, the human race has been doing itself gratuitous harm. Unintentionally, but doing it. Rapid, rapid growth of population, uh, uh, not not uh, focusing on the issues of waste and climate and and so on. And um, you know these are interrelated. Now, y y we don't want you to just start on any one of them. We think that you need a coordinated. You need the recognition of the significance of the threats and their interconnectedness, and then work in a way that works against each of them as part of an overarching plan rather than just a specific policy on population or specific policy on waste. I mean, they are all interconnected and you need to, you know, and I don't downplay the significance, population has run out of control in the last uh, uh, half century or so. And, and you, when you see numbers like 10 billion or 11 billion at the end of the century, when the Earth's carrying capacity runs out, somewhere, <laughs> we don't put a number on it, but let's say it's 7 or 8 billion, um, even with the technological improvement, you still have a lot of adjustment to make and a lot of a shift in attitudes. Um, these attitudes are shifting. As I said, the fertility rate has... Women have brought down the fertility rate themselves. But uh, it's still a way to go. Do you honestly believe there's going to be 11 billion people on this planet by, by the year 2100? Or? No, no, I don't believe those. I mean, they, they're sort of worst-case scenarios. <laughs> I guess is the way I look at that. Um, I think we will have reacted a long time before that. Uh, well, well, we, well. Either we we will have, or the planet will have. Uh, Thank you. I'm, I'm sure that somewhere in here, uh, in, in this 38 pages, uh, it is kind of the refrain. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, Tim Garrett, Dr. Tim Garrett. Are you familiar with? No, I, I'm not. No. Uh, okay. Well, when I interviewed him, what what he was pointing out, and and I think I think I remember reading this, touched on in this report, although it wasn't fully developed. Or maybe I'm just uh, imagining that I read that. But basically, what what Dr. Garrett was pointing out to me in, in, in my interview is, is is that in the next thirty years. In the next 30 years, the human enterprise on this planet, the human enterprise, meaning uh, the number of humans and each of, you know, our environmental footprints and all this, in the next 30 years, we are going to take, take every bit of the damage we have done to this planet from 1750 until 2020, we are going to do again between 2020 and 2050 and then do it again to make it four times by the by the year 2070 he says it ain't gonna happen something has got to give uh, if, if we keep going with with this model it it, 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 it can't happen it physically he is a physicist they buy it physically cannot happen. We cannot have a doubling and tripling of the human enterprise on this planet in the 21st century without a collapse. Do you agree with that or not? Yeah, I do. And I think that, uh, again, go back to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's told us a lot about what we needed to have thought about quite some time ago, to have listened to the science and to the expert opinion 
that has been warning of this possibility for quite some time. The, the warnings are there. In every one of those threats, the warnings are there. They're just being ignored by governments and policy authorities who, for a whole lot of you know, personal reasons, perhaps, you know, it's not going to happen on my watch or whatever. But then it suddenly did. The pandemic suddenly happened, just like nuclear war could suddenly happen. And I don't think that, you know, we, sh we should downplay the difficulty that we have is that this sort of scenario planning doesn't really allow for, doesn't digest the sort of changes that may come and may be required in order to achieve those outcomes. And that's what we've got to get some of this thinking done and some of this research done, some of this education of the broader community and the policy makers done. Okay, well, good, well, good. How are we 50 minutes into this? I, you know, I, I, do, I do not know where the time goes. All right, we've only got a few more minutes, so let's get to uh, what, 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 what some of the, the, quote, doomers down here might call the Hollywood ending. Uh, okay, we're going to get down to, towards the end. Uh, yet, however grim the threats we face, our message is one of hope. We haven't yes, heard. Sir. We have not heard too much hope so far. We can turn things around and reduce all of these threats if if we act together as humans on Earth. If we are willing to change our behaviors and adapt to new circumstances and new opportunities, and we can discover fresh opportunities more satisfying ways of life, and fulfillment from overcoming our risks. Yep, I, I firmly believe that, and I think you can see, you can see that demonstrated. In, as I say, the pandemic is a dress rehearsal for what awaits in so many areas. And, you know, we've ended up with a dramatic shift in personal and government and business behaviour in just the last couple of months. Uh, you know, where we've accepted the need for dramatic change, the norm, and we're doing the unthinkable. We, you know, we're not flying, we're not commuting to work, we're staying at home, we're even sort of growing our own vegetables, baking our own bread, whatever. I mean, social distancing and stay-at-home behaviours have, have just been imposed on us, but they've been accepted. And um, well, that's indicative, yeah. I think, what, what the process can be and will be. Uh, okay, well, I, 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 uh, I, I can't at this point. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to uh, get go. Yeah, we, I, I, again, I, I, I could open up a whole other line, but, it, but this is not the, uh, the time. I'm going down here to the various. So anyway, guys, you really need to go on. I'm, I'm going to put the link uh, to this, and they have links to all sorts. Good Lord, I need to go down this list of all of these other um, these other groups that you have links to. Wow, I, I could <laughs> I, I could do a whole a whole year of videos just from just from Appendix Three. Uh, Keep in mind, Sam, we thought we'd make your life easy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, no, I could just I could just do this one appendix, and, and I am and I am set with interview subjects. So uh, it looks like so. For further information, your website address and I'll put this on here is www.humansforsurvival.org, which is quite the. Uh, I'm just re reading some of some of the articles we will find out here. Uh, can we save the oceans? Call for a global plan for human survival, which we're talking about. Preparing for catastrophic risk. Earth driven to dangerous tipping point. Planetary arson and amplifying feedbacks. The burning Earth. And of course, the question, this will be for another, another interview, the big question. Has the collapse of civilization already begun? So let's end with, uh, with that question. Uh, John Houston, has the collapse of civilization already begun? I think it, it is uh, well on the way in the sense that we have um, governments and policy authorities who just don't want to accept the reality and urgency of the challenge. They ignore the science, they ignore the advice, 
as long as that happens, we will accelerate the process of collapse. Okay, and I'm going, this will be my, uh, I will be reading this probably to uh, tomorrow. Okay, uh, so John Houston, if you, I, I don't know if you are familiar with, with, with my interviews with Ju Ju Julian's on to me now. Because the way I always wrap up these in the last couple of minutes before this uh, camera battery collapses on us, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, where you had an hour to a uh, good 60 minutes, and you, you had 60 seconds to give the John Hewson and the Commission for the Human Future message to humanity in April of 2020, what would your 60 second soundbite be? sound like to wrap up this discussion? Sam, you should come to short-term um, focus <laughs> and uh, being able to run the world on slogans and sound bites and Twitter feeds and so on. Um, look, uh, I would say that the, the, the reality, the, the challenges are there. We've identified 10 crucial catastrophic risks that in the long term will, will threaten human survival unless they're addressed. The positive side is that there are solutions. They can be, they can be addressed. And collaboratively, we need to work uh, towards that end. And uh, so I would say that the coronavirus pandemic is a dress rehearsal for what we come to expect. So many other areas of these catastrophic risks as they unfold. Okay, and we will see how uh, we do with this with this fine dress rehearsal. So, John, stick around for just a minute after we, we close up. Okay. But guys, right now we're getting ready to collapse here. So uh, this is Sam Mitchell, and if you appreciated what John Houston had to share with us, please spend a few seconds to uh, thumb up this video, and please do subscribe when you're over here. But, uh, John Houston, we really appreciate uh, this hour of your busy schedule you have taken out to talk with us. And more importantly, we appreciate your years of hard work and your newest project. Uh, and keep up the good fight. Thanks very much, Sam. I appreciate the opportunity. Bye, guys.